everyone. I'm Tony Casillas, and I am your host of the Tony Casillas Show. If this is your first time, thank you for watching. If this is your fifth time, considering this is our fifth episode, thank you for watching and coming back. Um, real quick, uh, a little behind the curtain. So we tape our show. So today we are taping on November 5th, which is the day after the election. Uh, you guys know about that election. And as we all know, there's been a little contention and a little bit of controversy as far as who's going to be the president of the United States. And I just like to say this, because I'm not on this political pl platform, and I have so much respect for my executive producer, Kim Francis, and my producer, Kevin Ebeling. Um, but I don't like to talk about politics, but I just want to say this. Regardless who is elected as our commander-in-chief, whether it's Donald Trump, whether it's Joe Biden, let's all get along. Because we all got to live in the same country. We all got to accept it. So let's accept it. Let's be peaceful whether it's on social media, whether it's whatever platform it is, we shouldn't be judged of the color that we vote for. Blue or red shouldn't be interpreted as a, as a race, so to speak. So let's be kind to each other. Enough politics. Uh, again, I want to remind everyone to watch the show, whether it's Facebook Live, you're watching it now, or if you're watching on YouTube uh, TV, make sure you share our show uh, with others because that's how we build it. Uh, we want to really, really encourage you to, to, to make comments on the show, whether it's to our guest, whether it's to me, things that you want to see and talk about. I wanted you to be part of it. That's what this show is all about. All right. Every week we bring in a special guest, and my guest this week is a dude that is making a huge impact. He is a founder of Adaptive Training Foundation. They do so many things for disabled people, but more important, it's, a, it, uh, it's individuals with physical or traumatic impairments by empowering them through exercise and through the community. That would be Mr. David Fabora. What's up, bro? You looking great? Hey, man. Thank you. Likewise. First of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't congratulate you on your newborn son, 12 weeks. Yeah, man. What a surprise. We were done. I got seven and five little girls, and so all of a sudden there was this morning i was like 6 a.m i was eating breakfast and i'm pretty sure the eggs fell from my mouth <laughs> when she walked out with that stick and we both it took us like two weeks to be happy i mean like it was like yeah. a, oh, uh, uh, yeah. we just thrown all the baby stuff away anyway all to say i thought for sure it was a third gr third girl right because like, god has a sense of humor and that's the ultimate revenge right. she knows what i did in college and anyway, right. anyway without going there mom love you um, you just got to continue trying right? th that's yeah. it practice 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 yeah. so anyway <laughs> boom gender reveal Man cup. I think God gave my wife a boy. I don't think he was giving me a boy, but he was giving my wife a boy. So I'll take it and field Michael Vibora, which is cool. One of my buddies, Navy SEAL, was like, you named him Field. So one day when there's a stadium named after him, it'll be Field Vibora Field. <laughs> like, that's exactly why, sir. Yes. Well, you're telling me before we started the interview that he's, he's, a, big, he's a big kid. Behemoth. Eight, eight pounds. Did you say 12 ounces? Yeah, he was 8'10 at birth, but he's now 12 weeks old. He's 26 inches and 22 Boy, pounds. Well, your wife is hating you during labor, <laughs> wasn't she, brother? Dude, he wakes up so much of the night, I feel bad, right? That he just screams, and she's, she's a saint. She feeds him and, and I was going to say, do you get up and do you change diapers? Or of course, man. Okay. Yeah, of All course right. I do. But, you know, it, it's... I think it's interesting because my girls, right? Like last night, my how wife, are your girls? My girls are seven and five. Okay, so it, it, you know, daddy comes home and I'm the hero. Right. Hey. Yeah. And so last night, my wife, uh, I, I asked a question at dinner. I said, "Who's the cool parent?" And of course, right? They said me. You know, something about a girl. I have a girl, mm -hmm. Sophia. She's okay. 20 years old. And there's something about that little girl, man, that smelts your heart. And daddy daughter thing, right? Yeah, they got you. Yeah, so they'll choose me over my over mom any day. But you right? got I your guess. boy now, man. But now, so but that's the problem is now he's her best friend. That's what she says. She says, "Hey, best friend." <laughs> like the first night in the hospital, like waking up in the morning, she looks at me and she's got tears in her eyes. I said, "What, baby? What's wrong?" She goes, "Nothing's wrong." She goes, "In the night, he asked me if I'd be his best friend, and I said yes." <laughs> pretty sweet but yeah little little man is all about his mama that's awesome man congrats on your boy Thank um you. so let's start where it first started we grew up grew up in uh an oregon guy right yeah, yeah. oregon duck fan through and through uh pops played for the ducks thought i was going to be able to play in austin stadium unfortunately didn't get that chance i did get that chance but as a visitor <laughs> as an idaho well man. sometimes it's just not it wasn't in the cards that's right but I wouldn't change it, man, because what I was able to do as a true freshman at the University of Idaho, 
started real early, real young. I was like 190 pounds playing quarterback, or excuse me, playing linebacker. I, I was formerly a quarterback in high school. And then this whole like being physical thing and downhill on the run, being 190 pounds. Yeah, sucked. that's something about running into a brick wall that uh, sometimes uh -huh. 190 pounds, it doesn't work very well. Indeed. And there were fullbacks back then. <laughs> I know for those of you that are young and listening, that is something that is re relatively in Yeah, what's a extinct. fullback? Yeah. What do they do? They, Especially they, in college, yeah. right? Nobody's running downhill. Isn't it amazing college. when you watch college now? It's not a, you, there's no under the center. It's all shotgun, and mm -hmm. you know it's just the way the, yeah. the, the game is. And, and, and no one can college. tackle. Oh, that's <laughs> hey, as, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, did you always want to? Is that something you always had the passion to do? Is play football? I mean, did you play any other sports, or is it just yeah. I'm a football guy? I was a football, basketball, baseball guy. My freshman year, I quit baseball. Baseball coach, which baseball is my best sport. I know there's a lot of football players that say that, right? We go, oh, we should have went to baseball, better money and guaranteed guaranteed money, money long term no contracts, yeah, yeah, yeah. and physically you don't get beat up. But it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> right like it's yeah, not it is you know that's the one thing about baseball i mean you go to a game it's you're you know you've been there for three hours at the bottom yep. of the fifth that's it that's it and you just have to know that and check up like all right this isn't going to be an adrenaline rush right i may get something few and far between but for me football was always it i was a guy you know jumping out of my window in middle school not to go meet up with girls but to run down the high school field and throw the ball up to myself and just dream man just dream big so it was always in my blood yeah, that's pretty cool because that's the thing about the game of football. you got to have the passion because the physicality part of it. Uh -huh. um, what was some – you mentioned Idaho. Yeah. You mentioned your freshman year, tremendous year. What was some of your best memories from, from, play, from yeah. playing for the uh, – the, the Vandals. The Vandals. <laughs> I'd say, you know, this guy named Dennis Erickson, Coach E, who formerly coached at Idaho, had oh, tons yeah, of success. Absolutely. Before he went on. To, coached the U and yeah. had tremendous success. Legend, right? Yeah. So he came in my junior year as the new head coach and basically sat down with me and was like, hey, what? he said, what position do you want to play? <laughs> what? He's like, because I just want you to run and make every tackle. And I said, cool, put me in the middle. I'd always played on the outsides. And now all of a sudden I, I wouldn't have to be like, they could run directionally away from me. So now he put me in the middle and um, yeah, I started having 19, 20 tackles a game and boom, it led to some scouts looking at me. And again, I was always, my, my whole career, I was the like underdog, you know, that guy that's like, hey, he's good, but is he good enough to take that next step? And that certainly, I think, had an effect on why I do the work that I do today because I feel like I'm a champion to the underdog. Yeah. Um, and for me, football was just like, give me a foot in the door. Yeah. Give me an opportunity. You know, that's the thing with me. And you know, I wasn't the biggest dude. I mean, I've worked my ass off. And, yeah. you know, I think I always – Sounds like you, the same type of person that you felt like you had to work to get what you, you got. And that's such a great work ethic that you that you had. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, it was like, all right, I consider myself uh, actually this is I, I kind of steal this. It's from Clint Bruce, legendary Navy SEAL local to the Dallas area. He actually played in the league a bit as well. But Clint, Clint always says that he's an achieving average. Right. Not an average achiever, an achieving yeah, average, that's, that's average well talent. Yeah. Right. But through right. hard work. He's been able to foster success that beats a person more talented. To your point. Yeah. Well, uh, and then you, then you went to you know went to finished up at Idaho and had a chance yeah. to get drafted. Is people don't know about it. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Irrelevant is, for lack of better words, the last player picked in the National Football League draft. Yeah. What, what was your whole th thinking of that when that was labeled you to be the last player picked in the draft? I mean, because it come to, kind of comes along with the tag name sure. and everything. Yeah, and the stat, fun, yeah, the stats aren't real good for that guy making the team, much less playing. But for me, it was like, you know, uh, I was a late round pick and it was or late round kind of slated pick. And then the draft was going on. I think most of my friends had too much to drink and were passed out by the time my name got called. <laughs> but but Scott Linehan mm -hmm. calls and says, hey, man, like, we want you to know, you know, we're drafting you at this spot. Don't worry about the title, the statistics. But for me, it was like it, it much better than being the second to last pick because your signing bonuses are pretty much the same. But this came along with a bunch of media, right, a platform. Yeah, and I remember you. Yeah, That's it, right? Yeah. So it was like, all right, man, I could either see this as a disadvantage Right. I already had a big chip on my shoulder. I didn't need anything yeah. bigger. Right. I had something to prove. Mm -hmm. But it was like, this is something that I can take this perceived label and reposition it for for something impactful. Mm -hmm. And when I first week at St. Louis with the Rams, uh, the community relations department came to me. And were like, would you come and speak to this local elementary school? Love to. Right. And how I opened is I said, Tony, I said, how many of you guys have ever been the last pick on the playground? Hands shot up. I said, well, I was the last pick on Sunday night. And it's not going to stop me, and you, this shouldn't stop you either, right? So, again, it's how you position 
what it is that people label you as that can be your superpower. Yeah, it's kind of like your tag. And how do you use Mr. Relevant, as you mentioned, to motivate yourself? And yep. I mean, what other kids now, especially, feel that way? That's a yeah. that's a great way to to, to phrase it. Um, so you mentioned you played it for the Rams, and you you were Saint, you know, obviously in St. Louis at the time, and. Yeah. Uh, then you went to the Seahawks. Yeah, Seahawks. I mean, that you know that was a legion of boom back then. Yeah, it was, so what man. was that whole with Pete Carroll and Marshawn yeah. Lynch and yeah. uh, Richard Sherman? Yeah, it was fun. It was really fun. Were eyes a, a little wide open when you went there. It was cool for me, like being a visitor going into CenturyLink Field mm -hmm. and that hostile environment was rocking. But then all of a sudden, now to be the home team and to play on defense when when that sound oh is coming gosh. down, dude. Uh, you talking about adrenaline just. Just bolt Coursing through you. through you. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, Pete, you know, Pete got me pretty good. Uh, he likes to, as I came over from St. Louis, myself and Sidney Rice had just signed. And so um, he, he he's a prankster. Right? He's a jokester. And, you know, he, he opens the team meeting the first morning I'm there. And he's like, you know, he starts talking about these deep things, like real motivating, inspirational things like, you know, picking players like, hey, when you helped your mom through cancer, right? One of the assistant coaches who is uh, of Arabic ascent was like, hey, uh, when you took that suicide bomb off your cousin, right? I'm like, whoa, you know, this is like, <laughs> That's a, really this is getting big, you know? Okay, like I'm, I'm tuned in. And then he's like, right now we're going to bring up one of our new guys to share what really, what he's overcome. And it, he looks at me, he's like, Dave Vibor. And pretty soon, everyone's clapping. They're like, hey, safe place, brother, safe place. And I'm, it was like this inertia that was pulling me down in front of this team. And I'm like, all right, like, what am I going to say, right? Like, what yeah. have I faced, right? Yeah, and, and you're and, in front and, of all these, you know, these, these superstars and the it. Seattle Seahawks. That's and it. And all of a sudden, I'm like, Hi, my, and everybody said, shut the F up. And <laughs> ah, I started laughing. I, I, they bailed me out. But, but Pete, that environment's amazing. Pete kept it simple, allowed guys to play fast, made it a very friendly environment for your talents to be shown off. Uh, I left the year before we got the Super Bowl. They would got the front end then to help with that back end. And, and it just, you know, again, it, 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 was, it was a time and a place where there's nothing quite like running down the field on kickoff in Seattle Stadium. Yeah, I was going to ask you this. I've never, obviously never played in the Seattle, the, you know, the, the, tw the home of the yep. 12th man, where it's yeah. just so excruciating loud, especially for the visiting team. Yeah. What was that like? Because you can kind of feel it through the TV, how loud it is, mm -hmm. those decimeters and everything. Uh -huh. But how loud is that? Because I can just imagine playing, you know, playing at home there as yeah. a defensive player. Dude, man, you're talking about just more adrenaline. Yeah, it's sick. It, there's no drug in the world that could you know, <laughs> make you feel that way. I mean, it, it, it to me, like the closest thing to that level of adrenaline would be combat. It would be stepping outside the wire with your boys, you know, kitted up and ready to go take out some bad guys. Yeah, uh, that's great. Um, so where you are now in, in yeah. you know, 2014, you know, that was when you – or, you know, went to you started your your you know, adaptive training. Uh, the founder of it. Yep. Uh, so, what motivated you to do that? Yeah, man, I met a staff sergeant Travis Mills, quadruple amputee, uh, one of five living that was combat injured, lost all four limbs as a result of that blast. And you know, he's he, he basically it was like at a 40th birthday party for a friend, and I saw this dude walk in on prosthetics, and it was like the hot chick at the bar. I just beeline for him. I, I, I went up to him. And I said, yo, bro, when was the last time you worked out? And he made, he's like, well, do I, do, I, do I want to make you feel like an asshole? I don't have arms and legs, right? And I'm like, well, I understand you look different, but like, why can't you tap into a level of physicality? Because we all have to, right? Like there's a way to access the mind through the body that only some sweat psychology can. And, um, you know, he was like, you got experience? It's like, no, uh -uh. <laughs> but I'll, I'll research it. All right. And he was like, cool. He took a chance on me. And immediately what I watched as, as pretty soon he was doing 100-pound sled pulls on these short prosthetic legs. The um, YouTube video is amazing. Badass, right? Yeah, it is amazing. But all my NFL guys I was training at the time, their excuses vanished. Yeah. Right? Oh, my pinky toe no longer is sore. You know, and, and they would rise up. And, and it, was, it was cool. Even just civilian clients or non-athlete clients, they upped the ante as well. So I watched what just, again, Travis was willing to commit to, to overcome fear and to blast into this thing. That gave people confidence to do it for themselves. So I realized there was this void post-rehab. I'm like, wait a second. Where's, you know, there's the medical interventions, mm -hmm. then there's some rec-based stuff, but what's in between? There was nothing. So I'm like, man, there's a void for these people. What if I created a way to raise money so they don't have to pay for it and I can supply this training? Right. And that was it, man. We were off and running. So it just seemed like you had this connection. 
I mean, yeah, you saw huge. Brian, right? Yeah, and uh, you, Travis first. Travis, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Brian's another uh, – yeah. So, uh, another uh, vet that. Uh, no, I can. Let me tell Brian's story quick for our listeners. It's a powerful one. I was I was driving home late one one day from the gym. I, I thought my problems were so big, right? I, I was stressed out. My wife had called. The dinner was getting cold. The girls were crying in the back. Everything, right? And I come up to this red light, which I very kind of quickly uh, cut through a parking lot to try to miss a red light, <laughs> which is not legal. You guys shouldn't do that if you're listening <laughs> for, for clearance. But uh, in this moment, I, out of the core of my eye, I see this guy in a wheelchair with no legs. And my head, my head rationalized, you got to get home. You're tired. You're late. You're stressed. You're whatever. But my gut was like, you got to stop and talk to this guy. And I let that brain in my gut, that intuitive feeling just override all of the pros and cons and bam, stopped, pulled out, jumped over there and said, hey man, you know, I'm a retired NFL player. I got this gym, love for you to work out. Like he thought I was going to rob him as the story goes. Mm -hmm. But in this instance, he took a chance. And I, th I didn't realize at that time, this guy looked haggard, but he, he was going to bed every night with a loaded pistol. He was suicidal, just come off of another heroin detox. He was using drugs, just hoping that that was how he ended it. Mm -hmm. But now you fast forward, that dude is married, got a beautiful house, started a, a nonprofit himself, living up in McKinney, doing great. But, but the point being is like meeting Travis and seeing what was possible if you just gave him an opportunity. Now all of a sudden there was other guys like, yo, uh, you know, maybe there is a way for me to identify in a new way with my physicality and then train them to go bomb it down the mountain in Tahoe or surf a first wave in Cali or, you know, climb a big face at Yosemite. Like the, all, all these different opportunities, even though their body looks different, they actually have opportunity to go out and still export the physicality that is the alpha, that is that go-getter, just like we were in ball. Yeah. I mean, and that's a, that's a great point because I think every time we see someone and we, mm -hmm. you know, they're missing their arms or legs and they look and maybe we, our first uh, thought's going to be they're in military. But yeah. so how resistive were they to that? I mean, I know it had to be rewarding to see them kind of come out of their yeah. shell and really give them an opportunity to physically do something. But mm -hmm. what was the whole process to kind of get to know them and, and get them more of, uh, more of a confidence? Because I remember yeah. I, I watched that, and you're talking about the, their biggest fear is gravity because uh -huh. they can't stand up or they don't have arms. I mean, think about that, 100%. not being able to, to stand up. Well, life, life doesn't discriminate, right? Like we right. all could get in a car Absolutely. accident or a tree falls or something happens. Exactly right. right. And everything that you thought was, was your identity suddenly can be stripped from you. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, like in football, for me, as I transitioned out of the league, yes, I had the shoulder injury. What started with a prescription led to me coping with just numbing myself. Opiates, Xanax, like didn't matter. I was just, I was trying not to feel. Because the truth was, is I was scared to see who David was without the game. Right, that transition scared the hell That's out. It's scary of me. too, isn't it? Big time. People don't understand how hard no. that transition is. It, it's you're mourning the death of your former self, and then ask yourself, can I ever reach the level, the pinnacle, like I did in ball? And the truth of it is, is maybe not yet. I'm proof. David Vibor is mm -hmm. proof sitting here right now that the most meaningful things are still in front. And, and I believe that wholeheartedly. I had a respectable NFL career, right? Started some games. That was cool, being Mister Irrelevant and all that. Do I wish I had achieved more? Certainly. But what I realized is the identity crisis that led me to my ultimate bottom. I mean, I was on, I was on the floor of a drug detox unit. Seven-day detox, lost 34 pounds, had two seizures. At one point, tried to pick up a plate of food to feed myself. Wow. Couldn't even hold it. It shattered all over. I'm on the ground, embarrassed and ashamed, trying to scrape up this plates of, of tuna casserole and broken plate. And the nurses rushed in. I'm apologizing as they're restraining me because they thought I was going to use the broken plate to try to commit, mm. commit suicide. Wow. So you talk about that just, you know, a month prior being not running down the field for the Seattle Seahawks. And now all of a sudden I'm on this detox floor. So the question was, was again, there's a synonymous identity crisis with these veterans that come home. They can be geographically home, but not all the way home until they have a new community, mm -hmm. right? A tribe. And yeah. then a new purpose. So for me, it was like, yo, where do David's passions align with a way to serve those who served us because I wanted to give back. Yeah. I would have signed every waiver to go into the military if I, when I got out of ball if I could. But in the instance that, like, for me, the freedom was, hey, I see something in them that they don't yet see in, that, in themselves, so you got to try to lay the breadcrumbs out for them to discover it for themselves. And the gym is the perfect conduit to do it because the, the weights tell the truth, and a little sweat equity bonds each other. So now, to your point, how do you earn their trust? You wade in the water with them. You, you, you literally put things in the framework of R&D where they're like, hey, man, I, I jumped out of perfectly good airplanes. I'll be the guinea pig. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. we explore what's possible for the purpose of bettering it for someone else. Yeah, That's suddenly now a, a huge way to pay it forward. Well, I was thinking about this before we, you know, before we 
and I know we're going to have you on, I was thinking about exercise because I'm uh -huh. in my 50s and I still had my knee replaced four months ago, but I still had the capability to go exercise. Sure. The cognitive, we mentioned, we talk about cognitive health all the time as yeah. an NFL player. Yeah. But being able to have something to release all that stress. And these guys, you yeah, know, they bro. still, they come out and back, you know, come back from, from out of the military and war yep. and having to deal with the, you know, post uh, PSTD. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, the acronyms for that. Yep. But the fact that you're able to help these guys and lift yeah. them up and your story, man, with the opioids and having to deal with that, yeah. to that point about that, when you played mm -hmm. and having this label as Mr. Irrelevant, and we know as a, as a player, you got to play under the influence of some, some painkillers. But mm -hmm. for you, probably, you felt like, yeah, I got to be on the field, so I got to yeah. do something to take away the pain yeah. so I can, uh, so I can uh, perform. Yeah, 100%. Extreme pressure, extreme pain. The need to make sure, like, dude, being, you know, I wasn't ever on a big contract. I needed to show up every day, suit up, and deliver. And so that was a part of it. But if I'm honest, Tony, the, the real kind of insidious part was between my ears. It was less about the football player and the need to be on the field. It was, it was stuff where my worth was tied directly to what I did. If you're listening to this and your identity, your worth, your definition is solely tied to what you do, you need to go get a little soul check, yeah. right? Because the truth of it is, is like you're a human being, not a human doer. So at first you got to realize like all of your gifts, your talents, the, those are meant for the benefit of other people. Well, and especially to the point about that is that there's so many people today in the social media environment <laughs> They want to be famous, yeah. And if they're not accepted, or the influencers, it, yeah, the influencers. And then you know, if you have kids and that are on social media and they've been around that the rest of their lives, it's all about someone liking them on oh, a, yep. a picture or something. And yep. the point about not being accepted, I mean, that's can be really compelling. Yeah. People handle that totally different. Yeah, I mean, chemically, you could, you get a little hit of oxytocin and dopamine, right, when you get a like on something on Facebook yeah. or something on Insta or whatever. And, and that's a, there's a dangerous sort of uh, hollowness of this this uh, cognitive masturbation, call it, right? It, like you scratch the itch, but then it becomes more of an itch. And you have to gratifying. continue to go back. Yeah. That's it, right? It's a high. So, so where do you go then, right, to do something in a, in a sensory way, like exercise, where when your heart rate goes up, that little voice in your head that tells you to throttle back, right? That to me is, I, I thoroughly enjoyed living a life where that voice comes up and I get to be curious about whether it's true or not like climbing Kilimanjaro or running a hundred miles in 24 hours or doing hard things because through that I get to learn what's really between my ears and whether I have hundred miles in 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Expand on that. I, you know, I've never ran. I had never as of April 1st, I, I can't had never that. Like, ran that's... more than 10 miles at one, at one time. And so I had this, you know, this crazy, like, you know, I want to go and run a hundred miles in 24 hours. I'm going to train for it. So I started training 60, 70 miles a week. And I, it was about six weeks. I was going to do this over 4th of July. But then I was like, man, why would I do this in the Dallas heat in July? Memorial Day came. It was actually cool, cool kind of <laughs> rainy weather. So I set out at uh, 0530 and I ran for 24 hours. I completed it 23 hours and 51 minutes. I had nine minutes to spare. I, I couldn't walk for a couple of days. I was going to say. I lost every toenail. I pissed blood for, for a couple of days. But you know what? With eight miles left... I had, to run, I had to run sub 12 minute. I ran out of water, ran out of nutrition, and it was all mental. I went to that place, full cyborg, right? Like just went to that place to which I was, I was hallucinating. Uh, at one point, I was starting to run in this loop. My guy who was crewing with me got on my hip like a sheepdog and helped like funnel me back to Trying the like path. A leading, like a seeing eye dog. That's exactly right. And so for me, it was like wow. there's, there's only times and places where you, you breathe a little bit of uncommon air and you have certain epiphanies. Every step, the, have you ever had a panic attack or anything like oh, yeah. that? So yeah. imagine that feeling. <laughs> But that was what my brain was telling yeah. my body to shut me down, yeah. right? And I'd from one second, split thought, split thought. It, every, every second, was I was at war within my brain. But I just had to put the next foot in front of it. I started to override that. That's a muscle that you can flex anywhere in your life. So I like doing hard things. And the same thing is true with our athletes. These adaptive athletes, we're trying to put them into a, an ecosystem where they see that whatever they thought they needed was inside them the whole time. They just didn't tap into it because they felt like they put their own. They did put their own limitation around it. Yeah, and I guess the way when you look at that, uh, you you try to 
to live vicariously through them as far as and maybe you know, it's you know, it's not the best way to describe it, but a hundred mile uh, mm-hmm. you know run in twenty four hours and these you know these the military the guy the people that you're training don't have limbs and you're trying to like yeah. do something that you really didn't think you could do and overcome it probably not the best way to describe it but no, still it's a it's a you're talking about being mentally strong dude i can't preach that without going out there and, and seeking the purpose in my own pain because because yeah. wisdom is healed pain and for me like i try i like doing hard things because it teaches me about me and i did a show for national geographic that was in i think 2015 or 2016 but it was six days middle of the ocean bermuda triangle four foot four foot life raft no food no water with a partner that they like simulate a shipwreck and you get on with your partner for that. Now we were the first raft to make it. Okay. My partner was rough. (laughs) If you watch the episode, it was rough. I got salt abrasions head to toe. We didn't eat for six days. So it's a survivor. It's, it's a, it's a endure. Well, right. Suck fest. But again, the point being is I was able to draw on again, inspiration washes off, but if you can convert it into aspiration, you can, acquire motivation and then put it into practice. And then for me, like, again, if I'm telling these athletes, these, these warriors to be willing to be uncomfortable to grow, well, damn, I better be doing it too. Yeah. I'm just amazed. I watched all these survivor, you know, like alone, which is on Netflix yeah. and, uh, Super naked cool. and afraid. Yeah. And you know, some of these shows, I'm just am- amazed that they live on, you know, uh-huh. they, they're very resourceful live on bugs yeah but they can su- survive for 21 days it just makes me feel like a total like <laughs> you know like a, i'm soft here's the thing you would eat that person that you're out there with and you'd be good for more than 21 <laughs> days tony you just I break know. Them i don't like it. flesh man <laughs> that's great um so the, so it seems to me your philosophy is just train at no cost you know as far as just yeah. mentally and physically and just try to set an example of that, uh, you know, that's yeah. pretty powerful stuff, man. Yeah. I think you gotta be mindful, right? You, you, my wife always says she knows who she married cause I can try to be smart, but I can't be safe. Yeah. Safe is it? That's a yeah. death, man. Yeah, that's that a is. slow death. So for me, it's like a lot of people afraid to get out of that yeah. comfort zone. Yep. They yep. don't want to go there and feel that. And they'll say with their words that they do, right? But their actions are not following it up. Yeah. So, so to me, the integrity that it takes to put something up on the wall, right? And then be willing to go toward it, be accountable to it, and be willing to publicly fail if you don't, right? Yeah. That to me is where I find the most clarity, the closest thing to ball, right? The closest thing to ball. Yeah. And again, this 100 miles, I didn't tell anybody about it previous aside from the guy that was helping me but no one trains like that in the national football league no 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 time. they don't no no, no. <laughs> that's, just, that's no that, uh-uh. that's, that's totally a, different that's energy system. Norm there. <laughs> that, that's that's an old guy who was in quarantine with his wife pregnant <laughs> that needed to go get some mileage in uh but no i it, the the crux of it for me mm-hmm. is is i want again it could be a quadriplegic mm-hmm. who's willing to to push himself a few miles to take public transport to, to to go to the gym or to the grocery store like that that could be their 100 mile right and that's that's really cool too so it's not about you know equal comparison in oh what you did what mm-hmm. i did it's really just about the sacrifice that was necessary and the discipline that got it done you know i think it's interesting how creative you are in some of your training sessions with yeah. the athletes that you know that you train that again you know they're afraid of gravity because of no yep. arms and legs how do you come up with those type of training methods a, a lot of it is like Again, we want to keep them safe, sure. But safety for the nature of facing their fears, we find these growth-producing mm-hmm. fear encounters. Maybe it's uh, you know getting down out of your wheelchair, laying flat, and getting back into it. Like here's an example: one of our spinal cord injuries, we I had him do this. He had never done it all solo. It took him about four minutes. We right. timed him, and he was stoked that he got it done, and we celebrated him for that. But then I whispered in his ear, I said, "Hey, if your house is on fire, <laughs> does four minutes cut it?" He looked at me and was like, "No." I'm like, all right, so what's it got to be? He's like, 30 seconds. Yeah, that's great. So then we trained him, that's right? Awesome. Core stability, yeah. understanding a weight transfer. Yeah. But the main thing that helped him was he, he essentially used gravity, mm-hmm. right? To flop himself and then use the momentum and get himself back in the chair. And he was under 30 that's seconds. Amazing. So again, like the, the illusion is that the ground is going to hurt. But if you become like a good martial artist, right, that uses the momentum and then transfers mm-hmm. the energy... Um, it, it, it's principles that apply that work. And then when they work, it's like, whoa, if you were to tense up and tighten when you hit the ground, right, it is going to hurt. 
It would be rigid. Yeah. Sort of, this is a bad analogy, but the drunk driver in the car crash is rarely hurt yeah. because they're relaxed, yeah. right? So that Bruce Lee be like water. Mm -hmm. We'll use things from martial arts. We'll use things from Pilates. We'll use things from surfing. We got to make it fun. Rehab is sterile, right? Oh, X number of reps and sets do this. For, for us at Adaptive Training, it's about being innovative and creating a, a, an environment where they can have fun while they're doing it. So most of the, the athletes and the, the people that come in and train with you, um, there's a lot of them that don't trust you or they don't. I don't think they believe me but, right away. Or, or <laughs> think that they can accomplish because they're, yeah. and they're having a, it's an uphill bottom, battle, yeah. man. I mean, how, I mean, how, how discouraged does, I, I, I would say I'm, I'm, some of these would probably be discouraged because yeah. the unknown. Bingo. And we all feel that a little bit during COVID, right? Yeah. Like our athletes are the perfect example of the rug being pulled out from under them, right? The uncertainty of this pandemic and this election and all these. There's a lot of things that could put you in a fight or flight response, mm -hmm. right? But these athletes are the reminder for me. And again, my job, David Vibora's why, is to help people close the gap between who they think they are and who they're called to be, okay? And the becoming that happens in the process is, is honestly, it's an attribute to... I believe what divinely was appointed in their life that was meant for harm to be used for hope. All right, that's a, that's, that's a great it's a great message. Uh, one thing that's really impressive, you were uh, featured the 10 featured stores by the Starbucks CEO, yeah. Howard Schultz in their uh, series on Upstanders. Yeah. Yeah, it was that's amazing. Pretty, that's pretty cool. Super cool. That piece that featured me stopping in the parking lot for Brian uh, was powerful. You know, if you treat people broken, they act broken. If you look someone in their eyes, you treat them like a whole person, that person shows up. I don't care if they're disabled, homeless, wealthy beyond measure, right? Like you just but treat how, them as a human being. But what advice do you give to people that that meet people that yeah. you just – because I – again, people react differently yep. when they – and, and it's – some yeah. of them, just, there's so much – they can't handle it. Yeah, and I'm and I put yourself in your position. But how would you? Yeah. What advice you give people to be able to communicate and mm -hmm. and have a conversation with someone like yeah. that? Don't let your brain rationalize yourself out of engaging with that person. Right, like my girls, they don't see disability. They've grown up around this. Yeah. This is that right. So, but we've also taught them that you don't look away from someone in pain, that like, or seemingly in pain. So again, for me, it's like here's an example. Um, that's separate from someone with a disability. I'm walking into 7-Eleven one night with a combat injured veteran buddy of mine, okay? Homeless guy runs up. I'll be honest, I wrote him off. I went into the 7-Eleven. But I look through the window and I see him, him holding my, my boy up. So I walk back out to see mm -hmm. what's up. And uh, in this moment, I see my friend reach in his pocket, pulls out a $5 bill, goes and hands it to the homeless man, but holds on real tight. Homeless man grabs it, realizes like, oh, oh this bill is not, not coming. And he has to turn and transfer his eyes up to look my buddy in his eyes. Real casually, my friend lets go of the bill and says, you're worth it. Kind of puzzled, homeless guy turns, starts to walk toward me and into the 7-Eleven, but then doubles back to my friend and looks at him and says, what'd you say to me? My buddy real casually reaches down, pulls up his pants leg, reveals his prosthetic leg that he lost serving our country in Iraq. He looks this man in the eyes and he says, what I did for this country, I did for you. You're worth it and you're worth this money. Dude, what I witnessed was no small thing. Yeah. What, what occurred, right? This man took the money, didn't walk into 7-Eleven, walked down the sidewalk, around the building, and out of sight. What I watched was hope being dealt. So the answer to your question is you look somebody in their eye, right, as a human being first, right? Drop all of the narrative that you wrote, right, based around their color, their clothes, their this, their that, the other, and you just allow for the presence of two humans connecting, whether you got a mask on during COVID time or not. That eye contact is everything. But it can't be eye contact and a looking down on. It needs to be a person-to-person -person type of look. Right. I, I just think that that's so simple. Yeah. But the yeah, world I, needs more. I think yeah, that's right. And people experience that and just... Yeah, like what's really, your story, yeah, right? It, like just it, the ability to say, hey, man, what's your story? Yeah, and, and that the, fa the simple fact is I don't want anything from you. Yeah. Because wow. a lot of so many people think that you want something from that's them. That's so refreshing. And when right? and when and when you when they when you trust they when they trust you that you don't want anything. I think you bake, break those barriers. The real so I person think, shows up. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good. That's great. Right. Um, I know that there's a nonprofit organization, yeah. uh, but how can people get involved with it? Yeah. yeah, thanks for asking. You know, it, follow Adaptive Training Foundation on any of the social platforms. Check out the website. I mean, it, again, the videos are, are, are visceral, right? <laughs> They're very visible and very visceral. You're going to see people flipping tires that are is a triple amputee, right? Um, but, but I'd say this. 
as an invitation into this story, we do need resources. So if you feel compelled to buy a t-shirt, right? That t-shirt is something that'll go directly to support our athletes. If it's the case you want to sponsor a locker at the gym, those are pretty cool. You can put it in someone's name, someone maybe you want to memorialize. That's real cool. And there's, that's 500 bucks, right? That's incredibly meaningful for us. You can sponsor athletes, tons of ways to donate. But really, I just encourage you to step into the story by following us on social, right? Sharing those things. If something touches you, share it. Share it with a loved one, a close family friend. Again, you know, it's not just veterans and first responders. That's about two thirds of it. But there's spinal cord injuries, amputees, you know, it's Parkinson's, MS, stroke, you, you name it. It's a full spectrum of people that have dealt with trauma and impairment and now are coming back to train other people like them. That's when it gets really cool. Yeah. Is when you have the guys that come back and train somebody else with a similar pathology and they make it even better for the next person. That's awesome. All right, everyone. It is time for X's and O's. Hey. All right, Dave. Cool. This is a part in our show we have a little fun. We have X's and O's. We'll get to our next segment here shortly. All right. I ask you, you know, more life situations. Okay. Whether it's giving, giving uh, you know, uh, advice for relationships and, you know, dating, whatever it may be. But I, wanted, I want you to tell me the story of how you met your wife. Yeah, man. So I, I was living in California with a teammate. It was on the Rams with me, and I flew out. It was the Jerry's World grand opening, right, for Super Bowl. <laughs> I Ice remember. Storm. That was a poor, that was a horrible day. It man. was a miserable it weekend was. of weather. Yeah. But uh, I led to this epic connection with my wife. So I'd flown here. There was no Uber. You couldn't get a cab. I was at DFW Airport, stuck. And I called my buddy back in Cali. I'm like, hey, man, do you know anyone in Dallas? And he said, well, there's this girl I went to college with. Let me see if she'd pick you up. So she shows up with one of her friends in case I'm a creeper. Um, and I still, I remember exactly what she was wearing. I can see her right now. She steps out of the car. What was she wearing? She was, man, some black tights, had this like, uh, kind of like leopard fleece thing on. Okay. Right? Which was just, it was just awesome. Yeah. And I, and I, I, uh, I, I got in the car. I didn't even, hadn't even asked her her name. I just said, are you single? It just came out of my mouth. Like I didn't want to say that, but I said it and then I had to own it. She's like, yeah, right? Like, but and her friend kind of giggled in the back, and I'm like, oh, she totally blew that. I blew it. Um, <laughs> but, but as we got out of the car, back at, you know, I, I dropped my stuff at her place until I could go, and I was, I was coming in town to sell my Super Bowl tickets. Let's just say what it is. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know how it goes. Yeah, I, Make yeah. some good dough off yeah, of that. Absolutely. Uh, so with it, I, <laughs> I, um, I, I called my girlfriend back in California. I'm not proud of this, but I broke up with her over the phone. Hey, at least, at least you called her. There was no texting back then. Glass is half full, Tony. Thank you. Um, but yeah, the nature of doing that, because I just knew that like God slapped me upside the head when I met yeah. my wife, Sarah. And so the that, rest is history. So well, how long have you guys been married? So check this. Okay. That night we go out to old Dre's, right, downtown. And we're partying, mm -hmm. whatever. And I, I had the bold move. I lay a kiss on her. Dude, she pushes back, which has never happened to me, right, for the record. And, and with it, I'm like... <gasps> I'm so sorry. You know, she's like, no, Did you no, tell no. her that? This it, never happens? No, 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 this is my back. first time I ever do this. <laughs> but I looked at her, and, I, and she goes, did you have a lime in your drink? And I'm like, yeah, baby. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I'm like trying to play it cool. I don't know. This is never – and she's like, lime. I'm allergic to citric acid. Really? And I'm like, how allergic? Like, you got an EpiPen? She's like, I don't have it on me. I'm like oh. – so literally, we pay as fast as we can. We run across the street to CVS. Okay, she's yeah. swelling up like Will Smith and Hitch. Oh my gosh. Okay, she's face is going all pushed in, and she's got rash. <laughs> and at this time, I, I stuffed two Benadryl down her throat. Right, alcohol Benadryl, not a good mix. Now I'm literally carrying. So this her. happened in the time frame of this is over the first twelve hours of wow. meeting each other. So I'm carrying this girl back to her apartment, her loft downtown. I don't. I know her first name. I don't know her last name. I'm thinking about all the elevator cameras and things i'm like this if this girl dies i'm a murderer like i i will be responsible so the joke was you'll that be she, that creepy dude that's it yeah. so the joke was she took me home the first night um but i stayed up the entire night making sure she was breathing like keeping my hand over and that making is sure an she, amazing because story. i'm like and she woke up in the morning all the swelling was gone but she was sunburned look sunburned head to toe and it was that like look at her like either we're never going to talk ever again or we're is there, is there two versions of that story? Is it your I, version and her version? That's my version. You have to get Because I have a Sarah version of how I met my wife, and she has her <laughs> different version. But that's, yeah, that's just a hell of the a alternate version. ending. No, for us, man, it, that was crazy. She moved to St. Louis a couple months later, and um, she was with me through all that gnarly opiate addiction and all that stuff. And, yeah, she, she talked me into moving from Cali on the coast to Dallas in August, which was like moving to Mars. 
Um, I hated Dallas at first, and then I started talking about a culture shock. The people, though, people down here are awesome. Yeah. That's that's what changes. So you you look like a California dude, man. I mean, yeah. you, I mean, you, you're cool. I mean, good looking dude. And so you were like, you wanted to be the surfer out on the West Coast. Right? I did, so man. I thought for sure. I think I was Huntington Beach, looking good. I, you know, I paddled into this way that I had no business being on, and I remember getting caught in the surf and held down for a couple of waves. And like, if you've ever been in that, you feel like it's it. No, I've never done that before. Dude, when you're getting I, rolled by the way, in, in my prime, I would not do that. You need to. Because no. at some point, I, that in my is, prime, okay. I'm way removed from that. Well, hell no. <laughs> I'm paddling back out. I finally get out, and I'm exhausted, just smoking. Like, uh. And I remember this little 14 year old Grammy is just flicking by on the board, and he looks at me and goes, <laughs> Probably should have let that one pass, bro. <laughs> I remember thinking like, and I'm back. I was like 240 back then, so I was like, I'm gonna, I'll kill you. If I see you like but now nah, surfing, I still love it. It's still like, there's nothing better than standing on a board, flying on the water. But uh, yeah, I had to say goodbye to the pro surf. Crew. And you have three, you have three kids, two three girls, kids. and your your new newly born son. Yep. You, and you and your wife been married for how long? It'll be nine years next year. Nice. Yeah, we just had eight. So how hard was it? You said you went through that whole opioid yeah. addiction and, you know, and just uh, how, I mean, yeah. how important was she for you to be there to support you? She continues to be my true north. Um, you know, it's not, it could be, you, you can fill in the ick, right? I can be a workaholic. Mm -hmm. I can, you know what I mean? Like the narcotics for me was just to, like the first time to realize like, whoa, I'm so all or nothing. Right, the moderation is for cowards. Yeah. Like in ball, it makes sense and yeah. it works. But then you start to get into trouble outside in your life. And so it was maybe a year into adaptive training, and I was trying to still manage my for profit side. You know, I was training the Starbox, and I had my little people over here. And I just, yeah. I, it was great. I was connected mm -hmm. in Dallas. Yeah. It was some good money, but yeah. it was really just the. It was more of the networking. Right. And um, I came home. It was like two a.m. There was only one light on over the kitchen table. It was like interrogation room stuff, you know, I like turned, she was sitting there, I'm like, oh, okay. And I sat down and just real calmly, she looked at me and she said, do I have to be missing an arm or a leg for you to put the same type of focus and attention on me and the family? Wow. Oh, man, bro. how, oh, then but I hit deep. She didn't, she wasn't doing it as a dig. She was just telling me my blind spot. Yeah. Because what I was doing was a good thing. But she but needed more of you. That's it. Yeah. That's it. She said, yeah. there's no mission without a margin. Yeah. I said, yes, ma'am. And so I closed the for-profit. Actually, Sean Lee had gotten hurt. Cowboys called. This is a true story. So I'd been out of the league woo, for a year. And um, when Sean had gotten hurt, they, you know, it, again, it felt really good in my ego. Paycheck's certainly better mm -hmm. on the field yeah. than it is not yeah. for profit. But that Navy SEAL, I, was, I had my gym inside of his warehouse. And he looked at me and he said, do you want me to tell you what I think you're thinking? Because he could tell I was struggling with it. And, he, and I said, yes, sir. He said, I don't think you want to push pause on what you're doing now because mm -hmm. it's the most meaningful work of your life. Yeah. And that was the last time I thought about football. Yeah. I mean, I still see a couple of guys playing that I'm like, I bet I can go out and smoke yeah. that guy. It's right hard. Now. I mean, you but know, it is the, more, the, the farther removed you get, it's a lot easier to adapt to. But I'm not going to lie to you. Man. It was hard for me. And yeah. I played 12 years in the National Football League. Uh, happy I, wife, happy life. I got a question for you, Tony. What Do you find yourself still to this day in a cyclical, like seasonal-based – like around the time of training camp, I always feel like a little like I just want to punch something. I don't. Back. I don't. Miss, I, I, I tried to miss training camp. Oh, David. <laughs> you got to remember, I played back That's in true. the days where real it didn't doubles. Matter. They killed you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. these guys now. With what the about playoff time? Yeah. Um, Do you feel that around that time of the year? Well, like, I, I something think, in your well, bones in the, in the Dallas market is very frustrating. Yeah, well, yeah. And considering yeah. now and everything going on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that you once you're able to have an accomplishment, I always tell people if you accomplish something, you're part of history. They can never erase that. Yeah. And if you're able to to play and win championships and be with really yeah. special people, yep. those are the things that you have. But yeah, I mean, you miss it. I mean, I don't, they'll never take that DNA out, sure. out of you. But then when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, I'm messed up, man. Yeah. But I, I'd never, I wouldn't trade it, you know, nothing for in the, in the world for that. But yeah. uh, I mean, that's just part of the DNA. Uh, happy wife, happy life. What's yeah. that mean to you? Man, it, it's it's just showing up. I think too often how I would advise people here would be this. If you are trying to pour from whatever is left in the cup at the end of the day for your wife and or family, you got it wrong. right? Like I'm a guy who believes in quality over quantity in most places in my life. But when it comes to my family, I'll show up with quality as long as I make out time for quantity. 
And that's something that like me being consistent with showing up, I'm not, I'm not perfect. Actually, as a result of that night and that comment she made to me, um, I, I said, look, I'm not perfect, but I'll be better. And I have been, and I know I have been. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's showing up and you know, her love language is different than mine, right? So you got to figure out like, oh wait, why is she not getting that my acts of service are proving how much she, that I love her Yeah, where she wants like those words of affirmation. Well, I, I totally understand. I've been married 23 years and I'm still, love I'm, I'm still not perfect. Uh, you, you, have you figured it out though? You got the manual oh, no. for me? No, I, I have no manual. All yeah. I know is you got to roll your sleeves up and work hard. What about the manual for your daughter? She's 20 now. She's 20. Um, because if you were to ask, okay, so here's the advice I want to give you, David. Yeah, shoot. When they're 13, you know, now your daughters and they love you. The you know they're you're yeah. the, the king, right? And yeah. they adore you, and everything. But there's something about getting to that thir- that teenage <laughs> where all of a sudden you're like kind of pushed aside. Yeah. And it's like you try to get in the way, but you, you have to stay you're out of the way. Not that powerful. Yeah. <laughs> now it's Check. More, yeah. Now that my daughter's 20, it's uh, I look back and you know just be yourself, man. I mean yeah. to be a parent, man. It's it's. You know, it's, they don't give you a manual. They don't tell you, hey, look, you know, when you have kids, you know, you, you have a newborn son. Yeah. Shoot, man, they don't. I mean, when you had two or two daughters, they don't tell you. Nope. They don't give you. As long as they're alive at the end not, of the yeah, day. Yeah, it's just like life. I already know the answer to this question. Yeah. Beaches or mountains? Uh, beaches all day. Yeah. I do like rare air, though. Uh, after Kilimanjaro and then climbing some 14ers out in Colorado, I'm all about getting to that point where so 14 does that mean 14,000 14,000 wow yeah, yeah but Dude, Keely, man Keely was 19,000 I got a fear of heights so what what kind of high was that I mean how do you how would you describe that yeah it was just special Keely was special mostly because I brought this combat engineer marine above knee amputee oh with God, me that's amazing uh we were it was it was uh NFL vets I think there was six NFL vets or eight NFL yeah. vets and eight combat vets um you know uh Jason Kelsey Bo Allen um, Haloti Nada. Haloti was the biggest I guy saw that. I saw to ever he, summit. He posted his yeah, retirement, that was his retirement. message. On, and that was it, right? And he had that flag. That We're like, cool, it man. means you have to summit, bro. Wow. And it was crazy, That's too. That's a big man, too. So, so our guide, Orca, has got his hiking poles underneath his arms pulling Haloti, who's got his poles like this. And then Chris Long is behind Haloti pushing. Yeah. And like it took, but just the air is so thin. Yeah. You know, up there, like you start to get real. Rob Ninkovich, I thought was going to have an aneurysm That's and we we're going to have to carry man. his ass down. That's awesome. Yeah, it was, it was pretty special. But All beach. right. This part of our, our show is called Ben's Watching. All right, so yeah. we talked about COVID-19. Yeah. And we've all been part of whether it's watching Netflix or any app TV or binge yeah. watching, whatever it may be. <laughs> yeah. Spend a lot of time with your family, with your wife, trying to get a little closer, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. So how about you as far as <laughs> what have you been binging on? What what yeah. what TV shows or yeah. any recommendations you have for the audience for us? Man, I, do you watch I, TV? I do. I, I watch a little TV, mostly just games, sports and stuff. I, I am roped into The Bachelorette because that's my time with my wife. Yes, yes. All right, I so see you laughing, year, Kim. Hey, I'm the same way. Happy wife, I happy know life. Dale. I've done a couple of things with Dale. This is uh, like, Are I had no sure? idea okay. Dale was right, the guy. So we got this an exclusive. Summer, did, oh, yeah. Yeah, All okay, right, so go. Let me, so... <laughs> This bachelorette, and look, I hate, I've given away my man card, but you know, no, I know no, my producer Kevin doesn't watch it. But anyway, I don't care. My wife watches it, so I have to do what my wife wants, That's right? That's it. You get this to. Claire. You to. You yeah, I mean, to. this Claire, I mean, really? She's Dale a lot. Dale gets bro. out. She's a lot. Yeah, but I, uh, that's, <laughs> the, that's the problem. This dude walks out of the limo, and she, yeah. I'm in love with him. And the problem is, is all those other dudes are getting blank blocked the whole time. Yeah. I feel for those guys. I mean, they're actors in their own in their own roles, in their own movies, in their own lives. They believe themselves, but yeah, they're the all acting. Kind of like, unrealistic, it's, you know? it's ridiculous. Yeah. But I don't know if anybody. The internet always wins. If anybody hasn't seen the meme on Dale that looks like Leanne Rhymes, what's side Dale's side last side? name? What's his last Dale name? Dale Moss. Okay, look Dale up Moss, Dale Moss right. Bachelor. He's got some awesome um, um, uh, modeling from uh, the Halloween store, which are pretty. But he was a professional stuff. athlete. I like their their you know. That, what's your thoughts about that? There's like three or four guys are professional football players. Yeah, yeah. Like, what arena? <laughs> Is that because my wife said a... this was, makes a good point. Maybe they just don't have jobs? <laughs> yeah. There's like uh, <laughs> expert in custodial services. I'm like, bro, you're a janitor. 
You're a janitor. Like, let's not fluff it up. But no, The Bachelor, I've actually been watching a lot of kung fu movies with my little man. Now that I got like another bro in the have house. Have you seen the Cobra Kai? Have you seen? I the, haven't seen Cobra Kai. It's pretty How is good. It? Is it good? Yeah, it's you, good. Have you ever seen the Eat Man, IP no, Man I seen that. series? There's four of them. If you're into kung fu movies and you're watching this, check those out. You'll binge watch them. It'll take yeah, all Cobra night. Cobra Kai is probably not as masculine as what you're, <laughs> this you're is, referring to. This dude, it's actually based on true stories. This dude taught Bruce Lee. Oh, really? Uh, That'd back be in the day. interesting. It's, there's some, there's some of the best out. fighting scenes ever. But yeah, binge watching, man. It, it's honestly mostly kids stuff. Yeah. It's like, you know, just ridiculous So stuff. What, what are kids into now? Is, is Barney, Barney's not in the... In the is, is he still... No, in the, they're like watching YouTubers. YouTubers, oh, okay, that's they're right. YouTube kids that's that crazy, are worth like it? 10, 12, 14 million bucks. They do like this kid, Ryan, who's worth 20 some million bucks or more. He's that's doing, not the wig. Oh, so your kid... He's doing like uh, uh, toy reviews. Yeah. They're watching like toy reviews or IG sounds like YouTube someone's or something. watching uh, something that has something to do with their telephone, right? Yeah. The phone ringing. Well, it's because yeah. you're so popular. Tony. The, the silencer, are the silence on your phone that happens. That's but right. uh, <laughs> I, so uh, the whole the the you know the purple uh, the, the dinosaur yeah, with Barney Barney and everything and the dumb. Wiggles. So that's yeah. the, there's the, still a little like Peppa Pig, a little, like British Pig. I don't know. No, no, yeah. Well, thank God. I'm getting a nod out of your producer. Yeah, Kevin. You might not watch the Bachelorette, but Kevin watches Peppa Pig. I didn't say I watched it, but I mean, I'm familiar with it. No, that show's cool. Yeah, but you know what? The thing, at least you don't have to be uh, subjected to that. I mean, I listen to Those Barney like a little songs. Barney. Oh, yeah. yeah but anyway, yeah. that's just part of the whole deal. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, so no Survivor, Netflix, you know, or... I did get into... Uh, this Bachelorette. What was the... Yeah, yeah just thanks for reminding me. Uh, there's there was the I gotta uh, I gotta admit that kind of threw me because I'm like when you brought the Bachelorette up I'm like hey but you know Dave Moss you, you know, got stoked dude well, I Del saw Dave Moss it. a former you know the famous yeah. football player that played in the National Football League for ten years hey <laughs> I just did what number was he yeah I did a deal with him for I do some stuff for Michelob Ultra he did some stuff we were at an event in Chicago cool dude cool yeah. dude I got, I got nothing but positive good energy nice guy you know but questionable bachelor presence yeah yeah i uh, last one on a bachelorette did they you think they hooked up before that i do I well mean, i think there's i mean the whole covid thing like whatever also, abc's putting together yeah. they're not telling all this who'd stuff. have thought we'd end, this, end our <laughs> a couple of bros talking, talking about the bachelorette. bachelorette i mean this dude likes to he's a it's a freaking mountain trains these athletes man climbs yep. fourteen thousand feet without oxygen yeah and he's talking about the bachelorette yeah well that's a great way to end this interview hey brother <laughs> Hey, thanks a lot for thanks, joining man. me, man. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, you're awesome. Love that you're doing this, man. Hey, good luck with you, brother. Thanks, man. Wow, what a wonderful and passionate man David is. Keep up the great work, big fella. What you're doing with adaptive training and our military vets and everyone. Keep up the great work, my man. All right, that's going to do it for this week's show. I want to remind everyone uh, to make sure you continue to watch this on Facebook Live and YouTube TV. Again, I'm going to reiterate, share our show and make sure you comment to me or our guests during the broadcast and share it with a few of your friends. Tell them how much you love the show uh, and so we can spread the, the, the joy of uh, the Tony Casillas show. All right, until next week, thanks for joining me. Te amo. <laughs>